Reich has spent his whole life working on behalf of working people and the poor in this country. As Secretary of Labor, he led a national movement to abolish sweatshops and child labor, to raise the minimum wage, and he implemented the Family and Medical Leave Act. As an author and an activist, he has educated millions on the growing inequality of this country and why it is bad for our economy. 30 years ago, he started warning people about how Wall Street was taking over the economy and how Main Street had to fight back. Well, Mr. Secretary, I'm here to... Oh. <laughs> Give yourself a big pat on the back. No. Because of Occupy LA and the Occupy movement around America, this country is beginning to discuss an issue and a set of issues it has avoided discussing for years. And that is the increasing concentration of income and wealth and political power at the very top of this country and what that has done to the economy and what that has done to our democracy. But it's more than just a discussion. Because I can tell you, after having spent years in Washington, that nothing good happens in Washington unless good people outside Washington are mobilized and energized and organized to make sure it happens. <laughs> And it is beginning to happen. You are happening. And that gives permission to millions of other people to not only have the discussion, but also to get mobilized and organized and energized around the same issues. You see, when 25 million Americans are looking for full-time work, when 14 million Americans are out of work altogether, when millions of other Americans are too discouraged even to look for work. And when even people who have work are watching their wages drop. A lot of people say to themselves, it's my fault. They say to themselves, the reason I don't have a job, the reason my wages are going down, the reason I can't pay the bills, is there's something wrong with me. They don't know that exactly the same problems okay. affect millions of other peoples, that it's not something wrong with them, it's something wrong with the system itself. Yeah. 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 This economy is right now richer than it has ever been. This is the richest economy in the world. It's the richest economy in the history of the world. And yet, what are we doing? We are cutting education. We are cutting child welfare services. We are disregarding environmental problems. We are saying over and over again, all we need to do is cut this and cut that. We are getting rid of teachers. We are saying education. We are don't care about any of this anymore because why? Because we can't afford it? Well, let me make sure you understand. We can afford it. Yes. We can afford it. We, the people, can afford it. This, kind of, this economy right now is twice as large as it was in 1980. But most people don't know that because their wages, if they have jobs, their wages have stagnated for three decades. In fact, they've been going down. If you adjust for inflation, they've been actually going down. Now, where's the money gone? If the economy is twice as large as it was three decades ago, and if most people have not seen a wage increase, in fact, most people's wages are going down and they're losing their jobs, where did the money go? China. It went to the top 
A lot of it went to the top one tenth of one percent. Now, look, when I talk about this kind of stuff, when you talk about it, many people say, oh, this is class warfare. It is not class warfare. What it is, is a recognition that the system has got out of kilter, out of balance. What we want to do is the same thing the progressives did at the turn of the last century. The same thing that FDR did in the 1930s. The same thing that we tried to do in the 1960s and we certainly did with civil rights and voting rights. What that is is to save the system from itself. Save capitalism because capitalism cannot function when so much income and wealth are going to the top. Why do you think there's not enough demand for the goods and services that are being produced in this country? Exactly. There's not enough demand because consumers who's spending a 70% of the economy, they're worried about their jobs, they're worried about their wages, they're, they're, they're worried and so they're not going to spend and if they're not going to spend, who's going to create jobs if there are no customers? You see the vicious cycle we get into when so much income and wealth go to the top? But it's not just the economy that suffers. It's also our democracy. Because when you have an economy in which, and let me just give you some facts, and you probably know these facts already, but we've all got to make sure we have the facts together because they are truth, and we've got to speak the truth over and over again. In the 1970s, when I began to look at the, all of this stuff, the top 1% were getting about 9% of total income. I thought that was pretty bad. But it seemed to me that, well, maybe that's what's needed in order to provide entrepreneurs and inventors enough incentive to continue to be entrepreneurs and inventors. But then income kept on concentrating more and more and more. By 2007, the top 1% was no longer getting 9% of total income. By 2007, the top 1% was getting 23.5% of total income. And then you know what happened in 2008. Financial capitalism has taken over from real capitalism. Financial capitalism is taking over from products and services, from people that actually produce goods and services. And that has distorted our entire system. When so much money and so much income are at the top, and by the way, the 400 richest Americans right now have more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans put together. When you get that much income and wealth at the top, inevitably, some people at the top, not all people at the top, but some of them are going to abuse their income and wealth and corrupt the political system. I don't want to mention names like Charles and David Koch. That would not be that would not be nice of me. That would not be fair. But they, each of them, worth twenty-five billion dollars. What they are doing is using a chunk of their fortune to pollute and corrupt American democracy. And why are they doing that? Because they want to entrench themselves. They are petrochemical. They, they make petrochemicals. They want to stop uh, the environmental movement. They want to create doubts about whether there is, in fact, climate change. They want to cut the budget. They don't want taxes to be raised. They and other people at the top are using their political muscle to entrench their power and privilege, and we cannot allow that in America. <laughs> We must take America back because it is too precious. Our democracy is too precious to allow it to fall in the hands of a few people. Now I know some people, some people say, oh, this Occupy movement, there are no demands. They, they haven't got their act together. They're not a political movement yet. But, but let me assure you, 
Many of you have been, as I have been, involved in years past with the Civil Rights Movement, the Anti-Vietnam Movement, many other movements in this country that at their beginning, in their first months or even in their first years, we weren't sure about exactly what the demands were going to be, but we were motivated by a moral vision. A moral vision. A moral vision of what America could be. And so I say to you, whenever you come across people and say, oh, the occupiers don't have their acts together, you tell them there is a powerful an indestructible moral vision underlying this movement. And it is a vision of a fair and a just economy and a democracy that works for everyone. Yeah. It's not gonna be easy. Nothing worth doing in terms of social change in this country is easy. It's going to take time it's going to take patience. I know many of you who have been involved, you've talked to me, you've talked to me about sometimes you feel a little frustrated, sometimes you feel it's just a huge amount of work, you don't get very much credit for it, you worry that it's just never, never going to change, but I'll tell you something, there is nothing more powerful than people mobilized and organized and energized to make America stronger, and better and truer to its core principles. And that's what you are doing. What about the criminal? This movement will not end. This movement cannot end. This movement will continue and nobody, nobody, nothing will be able to stop it once it has started. Now I want to take your questions because you've got yes. much better questions than I have answers for. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't hear. Okay, here's the question. In my opinion, will Obama ever fulfill the promises he made to us in 2008? The answer is this. President Obama, if he is faced with a strong and articulate and powerful progressive movement, President Obama will go along. The proposed constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United, can you address that, please? Uh, you know, the problem we're talking about is not only a problem of Congress and Washington, or at least it's not only a problem of elected officials directly, it's also a problem, and let's be candid about this, it's a problem of our Supreme Court. And I'm going to name names. They start with Roberts, and Scalia, and Alito, and Clarence Thomas, and too often Justice Kennedy. And what they have decided, among other things that are heinous, that are ridiculous, that are grotesque, they've decided under the First Amendment that money is speech and corporations are people. I will believe that corporations are people when Georgia and Texas start executing corporations. Off with the head. Now look at in order to get a majority of the Supreme Court back for America, reflecting the values of America. And most Americans don't believe corporations are people. In fact, the Supreme Court, viewing the First Amendment in the way it's viewing the First Amendment, is basically saying to the rest of us, you don't have freedom of speech. Because we cannot get our message through with all of the money coming from big corporations and from rich people. You know, just as a sign of how far you have led this country, can I just say, just for an example of how far you've led this country, I go around this country, I talk about Citizens United, and people all over this country are apoplectic, they are enraged. I talk about Glass-Steagall, and everybody applauds. 
six months ago, do you think people would have applauded for Glass-Steagall? <laughs> you see the education, the understanding that is being created in this country? Here's something else. People on the other side say, oh, corporations, corporations need more money in order to hire people. They have to, they, their taxes have to be reduced. They have to have less regulations. Well, the reality is American corporations are now sitting on two trillion dollars of cash they don't even know what to do with. And the ratio of corporate profits to wages is higher than it's been since before the Great Depression. Corporations are hiring not because they don't have the money. They have plenty of money. They are all washing money. They don't need tax breaks. They don't need regulatory so-called relief, which actually means fewer regulations, health, safety, the environment, Wall Street. No. What they need are customers. They need demand. And that means they need people who have money in their pockets, average working people and poor people. But I want to just say one thing, and it's very, very important, because many of you here, for completely accurate and important reasons, are concerned about the environment. Some of you here, for very important, noble, and critically important reasons, are concerned about jobs. Some of you here, for absolutely terribly important reasons, want to move to what I think we should have, and that is a single-payer system of health care. Some of you are here, and you are right about this. We need to have a military budget that is half or less of the current military budget. Now, wait a minute. But, this, but my point is, my, here's my point, and many of you have other issues. My point is that if we hang together, if we, not get, if, we, if we get out of our own issue silos for just a moment, and if we hang together, we have a chance of changing this country. If we get campaign finance reform and get money out of politics, we have a chance of getting our democracy back. So what you need to do, what you need to do is understand this movement is about all of us. It is about all of our issues. It is about everything we want and everything we need to take our country back. In closing, in closing, let me just say this. Everything is going to... It's going to work out. Yeah. This, country, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this country, I mean, look at, if you look at American history, every time, it, uh, it looks like, wait a minute, before we get to revolution, let me just say something. <laughs> every time in, this, in the history of this country, when things have got totally out of whack, and I'm talking about the 1880s and 1890s and 1920s and 1950s, every time in this country when things have got out of whack, you know what happens? People rise up. The people rise. No. Americans can do it. No. And we can do it if we are patient, if we are nonviolent, if we understand the importance of being organized and mobilized, and if we educate those who disagree with us and listen to those who disagree with us. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're very happy to be here supporting this movement. We just want to encourage everyone to keep coming. This is Ozo Motley. We've got some music for you.